This is Tom Gardner representing the Computer History Museum at our fourth recording session in West Prest in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, today's session will focus initially on uh, LTO, uh, an acronym which uh, our guest who's given us a number of, a number of excellent and informative discussions earlier, uh, John Teal. Uh, good morning, John Teal, T is in Tom, E-A-L-E. -E. Uh, I have uh, gone through my biography in some of our other sessions, so I'm not going to spend too much time just to remind you that I'm a retired IBM engineer. I worked there for 31 years. All of my 31 years was in tape technology, the tape business, tape product development, uh, participating broadly through the worldwide market, in other words, all of them. Uh, today we're going to talk about LTO. LTO stands for Linear Tape Open. I'll talk about where LTO came from later, or one of us will. I have three guests with me that we'll be introducing in a little while to uh, talk about some different aspects of what I'll call the birth of LTO. Uh, LTO was announced, I believe, in no November of 1997. There was a joint announcement from three large companies, IBM, HP, and Seagate, of their intention to develop a new uh, interchange recording standard for a tape drive to be defunct. It's important to, uh, to uh, distinguish between what LTO is and what it isn't. Uh, it is not a collaboration to produce a product by three companies. It was simply a collaboration to agree on how we would be able to interchange data with each other and then the ability to go produce that product was an independent effort by each company. Um, that announcement, uh, let me say that LTO is a current ongoing business. Uh, technically, you could say LTO is not history yet. However, the announcement of the consortia in 1997 uh, is history, and that's the history that we're going to talk about today. We're not talking about the IBM LTO products. That would be another day and another set of people. <clears throat> so I'm going to set this up by talking about the what, the who, and the why. And uh, in order to do that, I need to give a little backstory on what it was, what the IBM environment was like in early 1997. Uh, what was the tape market like in 1997? And that's what develops the motivation for what later happened, and, and I think we'll make it very clear. So we'll start with the IBM environment in early 1997. We talked in some of our other sessions about how we had uh, developed a bunch of technology in the early 90s we were, that we were intending to use to enable the follow-on to the 348090 series of products would later become known as 3590 and 3570. But we, our efforts in 1992 were interrupted because uh, the regime at the time decided that we were going to exit the tape business. Uh, techno pilot technology was put on a shelf. Many of us redeployed to other activities. One of the activities I was redeployed to was buying other people's stuff and qualifying it for other IBM servers like quarter inch cassette, four millimeter, eight millimeter. So that's how I met all of the players in the, in the tape universe. Uh, other people were redeployed. Some people were simply told you're on managed departure and you can stay home until we, and get paid until we decide when we're going to exit you. So it was a pretty tough time. But we had a regime change uh, within a year or two, a fellow named Jim Vanderslice and his team came in and reversed that decision and said, uh, we're going to get back in the business, dust that pilot technology head off and uh, get it deployed. And, uh, and he had a lot of ideas from his printer background on opportunities for tape that we didn't see for ourselves. So for example, in printers they have uh, the equivalent of what they call the razor blade model. Uh, sell them a printer or even give them a printer and then uh, make a lot of money selling them ink and paper and maintenance and parts and service. Uh, because tape has a removable component, 
namely the media cartridge. These are typically not produced by the drive manufacturers. There's a whole separate industry infrastructure that produces these. Uh, these can be thought of as the razor blades, if you will. And Jim Vanderslice envisioned a model where to the extent that drive maker intellectual property is required to produce these, then there is an opportunity to uh, extract profit from the people that make these things and sell these things. And we simply are the market makers who deliver the drive, the capability, and the value proposition. Pretty exciting stuff. Uh, I didn't really understand much of what it meant at the time, uh, not having ever experienced uh, this type of business model. Uh, and we had a problem. In early 1997, Barbara Grant and Kevin Reardon, who were our leaders at the time, uh, told me that we're getting back in the technology business. And I said, well, that's going to be pretty tough to do because I'm the one who put all of our thin film head equipment in vans in the parking lot and sold it on the used equipment market. All of the tape head developers and designers are either retired, dead, or working for competitors. And there's a little bit true. All three of those statements, unfortunately, it's, it was true. And they said, well, we want to be back in the technology game. How do we get in it? And I said, the only way we're going to be able to get in it is to go to San Jose and beg the hard disk people to uh, help us out. Uh, is it possible to make a tape head in a hard disk line? We didn't know the answer. Uh, they told me, uh, they gave me a ticket to San Jose and said, good luck. <laughs> I was in San Jose six months. It took me six months to hire the first tape head manager in San Jose. What I learned about the San Jose environment is that when you're asking people to consider an opportunity or a challenge, they've got four godfathers and three grandmothers they got to check with that are helping them manage their career before they'll even talk to you. Uh, tape was not viewed as an opportunity. It wasn't viewed as glamorous. It wasn't viewed as uh, anything that would enhance the resume of a hard disk engineer. Uh, Kevin came out and said, okay, I uh, got interviews lined up for me. And I said, uh, no, Kevin, I don't have anybody <laughs> who wants to talk to you about this job. Uh, Kevin, a uh, very creative guy, um, rebranded the job as a notch your belt, one year in and out, great opportunity to enhance your resume. He sold it to the highest executives in San Jose at the time, in particular Bob Scranton. And Scranton endorsed it, and pretty soon we were getting the best and brightest candidates out of Almaden Research applying for this job. The first manager we hired was Shalei Asami, who uh, did the technology transfer from Almaden to San Jose on something called a spin valve head. I don't even know what a spin valve head is, but it sounded pretty fancy to me. Can I have some of that stuff? <laughs> Long story short, we finally got uh, some people going. Uh, we uh, had a media partner at the time, and we ended up expanding uh, our search for other media partners because the media partner we had was about as obsolete as we were in terms of re-entering the, the technology game. And uh, we had resolve, we had sponsorship, now what? So now let's talk about a little bit about the business environment at IBM, and then we'll go shift to the market as a whole. One of the reasons that we that the decision was even made in the first place that we might exit the tape business is because all of IBM's internal development efforts were aimed solely at what we called the enterprise market. In other words, mainframe attach. So our business was growing with that market growth, which was low single digits. That was not a very shiny looking uh, P&L to IBM because of the new regime of IBM where growth maniacally focused on growing your business faster than the industry. And the only way to do that is to expand your industry participation. There's probably other ways to do it. Maybe you've got some channel things you can fix, a uh, lot, lot of ways to do it. But one way to do it was to basically design a tape drive that uh, would serve a bigger market than just the enterprise market called an open systems tape drive. Unfortunately, we had a black eye. We uh, had already done that, 
with a product called 3570. That was a product that was specifically designed to hunt down and execute exabyte wherever they lived. We got some good traction with that product, uh, displacing exabyte. Unfortunately, the, uh, the target moved with the uh, advent of something called quantum DLT. With that, now I'll talk about the broader tape market. Um, there was a huge open systems uh, tape opportunity that opened up in the 90s due to the pervasiveness of computing, the maturity of personal computing, the uh, introduction of servers that weren't just enterprise servers. You had Wintel servers, you had Unix servers, you had AIX servers, you had AS400 servers, RISC servers, and all of a sudden there was a a blossoming need for tape at a completely different cost point that would openly attach to a standard interface like SCSI um, fiber channel <coughs> to serve that market. And there were a plethora of companies that blossomed to fulfill that market need. Uh, for example, uh, HP and Seagate borrowed the technology in a four millimeter digital audio product called DAT digital audio tape, and since it was a digital storage product aimed at music, uh, it wasn't a big stretch of the imagination to realize that you could easily reorganize that as a, a, a more general storage device that would take all kinds of data, not just music data. Uh, similarly, a company called Exabyte borrowed heavily from the 8 millimeter digital video technology that was emerging for consumers. and saw the same opportunity, slightly different price point, slightly different capacity point, but a complementary product that would serve other parts of that new market. Uh, there was a longtime player called Quarter Inch Cassette, uh, originated back in the early 70s, but various flavors of that cassette had matured into Trevans and Quick EXs, and there were a whole bunch of flavors of Quarter Inch Cassette. A whole bunch of companies participating throughout California, Colorado, Tanberg Data in Oslo, Norway. And so there was a lot of open participation. And at the end of the day, Exabyte began to dominate that space. And that is why in the early 90s when we were doing that technology for the follow-on to 3480 that became 3590, we also had this thing called 3570 a dual reel, smaller cartridge, open attach, to go after Exabyte because everybody was envious that Exabyte was making all the money. Then in approximately 1995 or 96, something happened in the industry. There was a bolt of lightning. <coughs> a company called Quantum bought the storage business from a company called DEC. And Primarily, Quantum uh, made the investment because they wanted to get into the disk business. Deck had a, I, I don't know the details of a deck hard disk, but apparently it was attractive to Quantum. And uh, along about Christmas time, Quantum opened up the box of what they bought from Deck, and there was a diamond in the rough in there. There was a tape drive in there, a tape drive that no one had ever heard of. A proprietary tape drive that Deck had been selling only for their servers for many years, but it was never publicized or marketed or it was an accessory to a mainframe sale from DEC. They opened it up and saw the potential for this uh, diamond in the rough, which was a tape drive. It had a cartridge similar to 3480, a little kind of boxy, a single reel. Uh, it had a lot more capacity than what Exabyte was able to deliver with a dual reel cartridge in approximately the same space. And they saw the opportunity to take that to open systems, rebrand it, and uh, go hunting Exabyte with that uh, weapon. It became known as DLT, Digital Linear Tape, is how uh, Quantum decided to uh, market it. And they, in very rapid order, and, and there's a market dynamic where cost was king depending on which server and all of a sudden over time because of the internet, capacity was becoming king. <coughs> and Quantum ended up basically wiping out all of those other formats, made them obsolete. 
and one by one, slowly, all of those little companies that were doing four millimeter, eight millimeter, quarter inch, uh, many of them went away, many of them were acquired by other people. I know Seagate bought quick companies in Colorado, HP bought one in Colorado. But it was clear that uh, Quantum uh, redefined the game. Uh, it's all about capacity, deliver it as cheaply as possible, and the uh, IBM mantra of absolute reliable bulletproof was not affordable in the market and it was not uh, a high requirement. So we missed. 30, 3570 did exactly what we wanted it to do. It hunted exactly where we wanted to hunt and then the market moved way over here. And it was all about capacity. And there was no way we could get enough capacity in a dual reel cartridge to ever compete with uh, DLT. What are we going to do? So Kevin Reardon, who was our executive at the time, and I are drinking beer in his backyard. And Kevin had a optical disc background. And he brought a perspective of the power of a interchange standard. I was certainly familiar with interchange standards. IBM kind of tended to give them away. We'd go to ANSI, we'd go to ECMA, we'd volunteer all of that information. When you do a real standard through a standards body, you sign a piece of paper that says, thou shalt license reasonably. You're not allowed to get a standard accepted in the international community and then hold everybody hostage who wants to practice. That's against the spirit of the international standards community. Well, Kevin was familiar with something called an ad hoc standard, where you don't actually go through a formal process to establish the standard. You simply uh, make it available to be licensed by anyone. You don't have to license as reasonably, and you don't have to adhere to the rules of ECMA or the rules of ANSI, or I think there's a one even above that that I forget what it's called. So that kind of clicked. I was filling Kevin in on what I thought our technical capability was. I said, you know, we can take that same engine in 3570 and port it into a big, big single reel cartridge and very easily produce a competitive product with DLT without a whole lot of invention and risk. It'll be a lot of work, but it won't be a ton of invention. But can IBM all by itself be successful with that? Because IBM has some corporate overhead that's a little unusual. We're talking about a market where you, you, you really can't afford that kind of overhead to be successful. And furthermore, would anybody follow us? So the next brilliant idea Kevin had was uh, Kevin and I had already traveled the world trying to get partners in many other areas of our business when we were trying to re-enter because we had atrophied so much of our technology. We had been to Japan looking for automation partners, deck partners, mechanical partners, uh, head partners at San Jose, we even partnered with IBM Japan for chips and microcode. So we knew the drill and we just decided we needed to go visiting different kinds of people. We needed to go visit people that might uh, have an axe to grind with DLT, might have a need, and, and who also were market makers like us that could help us build the market. So at some point we knocked on HP's door, visited a fellow named Jim Browning, the executive from HP at the time. I don't honestly remember where we met Jim. I think it was a hotel room in San Francisco or something. I know it wasn't in Boise because I've never been to Boise. And, uh, you know, we're being a little coy. We don't really want to put all our cards on the table. We're kind of fishing for would HP be interested in doing anything with us. Kevin had a prior relationship with HP because I believe we bought some optical libraries from HP and rebranded them with our name. So that's why Kevin was comfortable going there. Jim Browning said, well, what do you got, you know, what do you got in mind? What do you think you could make? And Kevin looked at me and kind of gave me the green light. And I said, I don't think it would be too difficult to get 100 gigabytes in a cartridge about this big. And his eyes just lit up. There was immediate resonance because unbeknownst to Kevin and I, uh, HP had been partnering with Seagate for many years in the four millimeter arena. HP was the leader. They would kind of establish what they were going to do and then Seagate, HP would service a uh, large part of retail and a little bit of OEM and then they would recruit Seagate to go in and fill out all the rest of the OEM channel and uh, 
very effective relationship between those two. So unbeknownst to Kevin and I, HP and Seagate already had a project cooking internally. It just happened to be right about 100 gigabytes. It just happened to be an architecture similar to what I was alluding to. <coughs> and this immediately opened the door for uh, more conversation. Jim asked us to go visit Seagate because if HP was in, Seagate had to be in, and if IBM didn't accept that, then HP and Seagate would just continue doing what they were doing. Didn't really know Seagate. I, I knew them from buying four millimeter stuff from them. So we went to Costa Mesa, I believe it is, and we met the Seagate executive at the time, a guy named Jesse Spear, and his uh, executive uh, technical guy was a guy named Leroy Thompson, and then their big uh, technical gun was a guy named Bill Buchan. We sat down with them, and uh, HP had already given them a send ahead on why we were there and what we wanted to talk about. They were extremely receptive. They were also sensitive to the fact that unlike HP, we were a customer. So we were a customer to Seagate, where we were not a customer to HP. So let's just say it was not difficult to get Seagate to agree to let IBM join their party. So the table's set, the time is right, we got a mission, we know what we got to do. Now, how do we do it? What do we do? Not as simple as you think, because we didn't really know what we were going to do. We realized very quickly that outright collaboration on the development of a family of products would involve uh, taking the square root of the sum of squares of our tape market share and would probably attract attention we didn't want from the federal government. So that was out. Because you might think on the surface that that was the plan, okay, and I'll provide heads and you go get a deck, and et cetera, et cetera. You do some chips and we're all going to be happy and we're all going to take it to market in our channels. Another nice thing about the construct, by the way, of HP, Seagate, and IBM is that it appeared without even having to have anything close to an illegal discussion that we served different markets. In other words, we had channel compatibility. We had more channel compatibility than channel conflict. That was serendipitous. You know, we that was something that we just kind of realized after the fact that made proceeding uh, more comfortable for all of us involved. So the executives got together, the three execs were uh, Jim Browning, Jesse Spear, and Kevin Reardon. They each brought their head business person, because now this is not a technical discussion, now this is a how do elephants mate discussion. And uh, they ended up coming out the door kind of where Kevin thought it would land that we were going to uh, work together to develop an interchange standard. Completely legal, completely clean, nice, neat, and then we would go compete in the space that we create. And, uh, and that was the birth of what became known as LTO. So, uh, we had contracts to sign, there were still months of legal and business wrangling on a three-way contract between our companies that would enable the technical people to engage and get to work. Uh, there was lots of discussion about what are we going to call this thing. And I'm going to let people like uh, Brad and Bruce give their version later, but I'm pretty sure LTO, uh, first of all, it had to be three letters, like DLT. We really wanted the letter L in there bad, but we also wanted to differentiate our three letters from DLT by adding an O for open, implying that DLT was a monopolistic, single source, proprietary product, and we could use the O for open to help us ultimately market the category. I'm going to call it a category. And in fact, we were so excited attracted to this that shortly after we uh, finally did do the press release that these were our intentions, uh, we went to Las Vegas and invited a whole bunch of people, uh, companies that we thought might be interested in participating, people like Jesse Oida came, uh, Juan Rodriguez, in other words, prospective licensees of this thing when it comes to pass, hundreds of people. Wind them and dined them in a big ballroom and gave everybody a ticket to the O show. O for open, O show, 
I believe that was at the, uh, I forget which hotel it was at. Do you remember? Bellagio. Bellagio. Yeah, pretty good digs. Coolbrook. And we had a great time and everybody got kind of plastered and served its purpose. It was sort of our first public unveiling uh, subsequent to the announcement. Everybody got a ticket and lo and behold, technical difficulties, oh show canceled tonight. The business people from the three companies were hysterically running around attempting to retrieve all of the tickets that they had passed out so that they could get them refunded. We're talking ten or twelve thousand dollars worth of tickets. And uh, a lot of people, more than half, guilty as charged, walked over to the box office. I gave them my ticket. They gave me 125 bucks and I went and put it in the slot machine. <laughs> I think it's okay to say that now. So uh, that was the birth, and now it's time to get busy. How do we structure this? How do we organize? Well, in someone's infinite wisdom, a great idea, we decided to, we, we decided that we needed to eliminate partisan bickering if possible. We needed a structure where when you were, when you were in that room, you weren't IBM and you weren't HP and you weren't Seagate. You were LTO. You left your IBM hat at the door, put on an LTO hat, you're one team. We decided to organize as what we called a virtual company. And we identified, I think, six or seven unique roles and responsibilities. Each company would plug a person into each of those roles and responsibilities. And very briefly, we had what we called the executive sponsorship team. I've already mentioned their names. That was one of the roles. They were kind of a went to them for guidance. If we needed guidance, we went to them to resolve contention if that was necessary. We had an appeals process. In addition, each company appointed a technical leader. I was the technical leader from IBM. Uh, you'll meet Ed Childers sitting over there lady, later who is the current technical leader from IBM. And I was going to say that uh, he's retired, but I, I'll just, I, I would just be joking. Ed is still in the game very much. And he'll tell you a little bit. He'll give you an update at the end. Uh, we had a, uh, each, each company had a marketing team lead to say, how are we going to promote this category? How are we going to sell vaporware until it's real? That kind of thing, the, the marketing thing. And uh, Bruce Master will be joining us later as a former marketing rep to LTO to tell you a little bit about what that was like. Each company had a business person. They were responsible for resolving a myriad of business issues, contracts, licensing, details of licensing, uh, all kinds of stuff. Uh, we'll be introducing Brad Johns, who uh, at one time was the business rep from IBM. Um, each team had a finance person. Those people were a little less visible in the process because we did have a vision that at some point LTO would generate its own revenue through the licensing of the specification. But until then, somebody had to pay the bills for all the, the meetings and all the things that had to happen before we even had something to, to put out there. And uh, I believe Mary Ramsey was our first finance rep and perhaps our only one and right up till she retired. And I don't even know if there is a, a rep anymore. In addition, even more mysterious, each company donated a lawyer say that right, lawyer, um, because we had a lot of guidelines on what we could talk about, what we couldn't talk about, because like I said, there was sensitivity about three large members of the industry working together, and uh, there was a lot of devil in the details of licensing agreements. Um, and one of the things I'll caution you right now the four of us here are not even entirely certain uh, what we can and can't reveal. Uh, we're going to use our judgment and uh, hopefully nobody will get in trouble uh, because we've had a lot of experience uh, talking about something we're not supposed to talk about and being okay with it. Um, so the table set and the three technical leads got together. We knew what our assignment was. Oh, I wanted to I'll say something about rules of engagement. Uh, this was a very beautiful uh, construct, this virtual company. And it came with rules of engagement, 
process of appeals, you know, there were a lot of things that we anticipated uh, would happen. One rule of engagement was that everything was going to be done by consensus. This was not a voting model. If any one of us dissented, then there was no agreement until we all agreed. Which, in some ways, is a little bit less efficient way to get to the end result. But in other ways, uh, it, it sure goes a long ways toward keeping the peace. And had we had a voting model, it would have been Seagate and HP beating uh, Seagate and HP beating IBM every single time. Because Seagate would always look at HP and say, what do you want us to do? Uh, the other rule of engagement was that in the event of a technical disagreement, the guidance we got from the executives was that the tiebreaker will be based on best of breed always. In other words, we're not going to make a technical agreement that maybe advantages one company, disadvantages another, unless it is the right selection. And let me give you a tangible example of that concept at work. Very early on in LTO1, uh, we all agreed that we need to have uh, compression. That was standard in tape. Uh, for many, many years, HP and Seagate had been shipping a compression scheme known as LZ2. They were very comfortable with it. It was in all their products. They had a very mature core in their chips. And they said, yep, LZ2. IBM, for many, many years, had been shipping LZ1. And we had a core, and we were comfortable. And, and so it, it's hard not to be a little bit parochial. If I agree to LZ2, then i got to get a whole bunch of logic guys scrambling, because I don't even have that. And they're going to be advantaged. Now, remember, our schedules our race to market were completely independent autonomous activities by the three companies. <laughs> so to agreeing to something that was going to hurt basically meant you had to run that much faster when you got home and you had to endure the wrath of all the people that wanted to know why the idiot agreed to that. Okay, So you can, you're starting to get a flavor of what this was like. So how did we resolve LZ1 and LZ2? Because both sides were entrenched well, we made a good old-fashioned decision matrix with best of breed at the top, and we agreed on a definition of best of breed, not only in terms of the uh, efficiency of the compression algorithm against different types of data. You know, there's all Calgary corpus and different things do things differently. But also implementation. We evaluated it. We looked at it. LZ1 won the day, because LZ1, it turns out, from an implementation perspective, is extremely symmetrical, where LZ2 is not symmetrical at all. And to HP and Seagate's credit, they accepted it, they signed up. The model was working, the rules of engagement were working, and it was a beautiful example. Uh, HP, don't feel too sorry for HP and Seagate yet, because when we got to Gen 2, they wanted to get rid of our crappy little uh, peak detection channel and replace it with PRML. And uh, that was best of breed, I had to agree. <laughs> so later on, they won the day. So this was a very dynamic process, but I, I thought it was a very well orchestrated. Now, that's not to say that the meetings were easy. We literally had people getting mad and leaving the room. I think we had one guy cry. <laughs> And maybe some of these guys will share some stories with you. Because there's all, you know, the whole universe of personalities involved, not to mention your natural parochial uh, leaning. So back to the technical managers getting together, we realized that we needed, that no one of us was smart enough to develop an entire interchange specification. It's a vast document with a lot of disciplines that need to be represented. So we formed five, I think, technical working groups that came to be known as TWIGS. So these were additional members from each company that would meet on a subset of what we were trying to do. One of those TWIGS was the cartridge media people. Because in an interchange standard for tape, you define the cartridge physically in great detail. You don't 
dictate the formulation or anything, but you say it's got to have these performance characteristics, this coercivity, this SNR enablement, blah, blah. That's a whole art into itself, and Ed Childers, who'll join us later, was the original person on the media cartridge twig. Uh, the invention of a new cartridge was arguably the biggest amount of work to do, and I'll, I'll tell you why that's true in a minute. We had other twigs. We had a what we called a logical twig. These are the guys that are defining the digital details of uh, how you write the data and all that jazz, ECC, um, and we had a few other tweets. I don't remember what they all were. I think we had a, in fact, maybe I'll just, I'll let Ed talk more about that when he gets up here, so just make a note of that, Ed, to talk about twigs. Or, or you can add, add them in, in the transcript, one, two, three, four, five. Sure, well, we'll let Ed talk about it. Um, okay, let's talk about this first major decision we made. None of us were that concerned about the technology. Like I say, 100 gigabytes wasn't that big of a stretch from stuff that we were already shipping. In other words, no, a four millimeter cartridge from HP was not capable of 100 gigabytes. But the aerial density, when applied to a cartridge with a lot more square inches a day, came pretty close. Our aerial density of our 3570 tape was actually 10% higher than the original DLT, which I think was in the 80 gigabyte range, I don't remember the exact number. But, and of course IBM came to the party with this 3480 cartridge and said, here's the answer, we'll give it to you, we'll give you the design, we won't charge you anything, it's free, we'll donate it. HP said no thanks. Um, not because uh, they were being parochial, but because they were serving an entirely different market from IBM. And one of their internal requirements, which was not an IBM requirement, was a cartridge that could enable in the future a half I drive. The 3480 cartridge doesn't enable a half I drive for a couple of obvious reasons. Uh, one is uh, it's a little thick and we thinned it out, but that wasn't the big one. The big one was this leader block and the engineering requirements that go into designing a way of threading the tape. The threader that we used on 3480 uh, wouldn't fit in a full height version. IBM didn't put tape drives in servers, they were peripherals. HP did put tape drives in servers. So we had to acquiesce to that and that uh, we certainly couldn't use a quantum DLT cartridge. Yeah. For the record, the tape is actually sticking out of the cartridge. It uh, is. You pop the leader block out and can't get it back in. Yep, I did that yesterday to demonstrate a point, and now I, there's a special tool you use to fix that, and I don't have one, but that's a fix it for me. So, this was daunting. All of a sudden, this was an element of technical and schedule risk that wasn't really anticipated when we had the big party and got all excited about it doing something. So the evolution of this cartridge, um, I'm going to let Ed give you some backstory on it. I've already spilled a little bit of your thunder, Ed. I indicated that one time the marketing guys cornered you guys to do a white paper on all the great things about it. And I remember Tom from HP saying, well, it's really not that remarkable. <laughs> Would you put it back there for a second? Oh, sure. Let me some background down on the table, please. Thanks. So this is actually not a production cartridge, right? It was a gift yeah. to you from? IBM Japan, after we shipped the first product. And, and the characters in Japanese on the front? Uh, that character stands for warrior. There was a joke about my name. Everybody would misspell my name and leave the uh, silent E off the end. So I used to introduce myself by saying, teal with an E is a Scottish warrior, teal without an E is a duck. So this is the kanji for warrior, and it was uh, given to me as a thank you because it may sound funny that we're internally partnering, but IBM Japan is a universe away from IBM Tucson in every possible respect. So it really was like partnering with an external entity. Uh, we ended up creating the 40 or 50 jobs in Japan that otherwise wouldn't have existed, and they were extremely uh, grateful to us for including them in the team. So which character is Warrior? 
Uh, that's uh, one big kanji character, I think. I don't know. I don't read Japanese. <laughs> we can take that as a to-do. I thought there were two kanji characters. There, there. might be. I, I don't read it. Most Japanese don't even read kanji. They have two other alphabets they prefer. Okay, where was I? Uh, okay, I give an example of rules of engagement. I, I talked about the twigs. I talked about the impact of the cartridge decision. You know, we spoke about 3480 the other day, and we talked about kind of the assumptions that went into 3480 that, that created all the pain. Well, the cartridge assumption was probably the biggest assumption uh, that was made that created almost all the pain. Because now we're talking new mechanism. You know what's involved in developing a mechanism. We're talking new threader. We're talking of hours and hours and hours of engineering debate to agree to a pen. And more on that later. I think I pretty much set the stage here, and I think now uh, you're probably tired of hearing from me, and I'm going to let, uh, I think we'll go, who wants to go first? Ed's going last. So I have a couple of follow-up questions. Sure. If you don't mind. And 40 minutes, what did I tell you? The Las Vegas meeting date, you can either add it back in or if you remember it now. I don't, but we can probably find out. Um, it was shortly after we announced the, uh, yeah. the big announcement. And the O show canceled, I believe it was mentioned, but you didn't say why? They said technical difficulties. Uh, Apparently when you put the, these big Cirque Soleil shows together, there's just a ton of uh, technology involved in uh, putting on the production, if you've ever been to one. I finally did see the O show many years ago, and it's quite a spectacle. Uh, that particular night, we were simply told technical difficulties will refund your money if you find the tickets. And you mentioned LZ1, one out over LZ2, because it was symmetrical, symmetrical because means? The, uh, it's, it's what we call elegance of implementation. So elegance of implementation was one of our decision criteria. Mm -hmm. So the difference in performance between the two compression schemes was not that big a deal. Uh, you know that when you pick a compression thing that you, uh, you can have, you, you have about three different sizes of uh, compression buffer that you can choose from and we tended to pick the middle one and a lot of details but at the end of the day everyone agreed that LZ, the implementation of LZ1 was considerably more elegant than the implementation of LZ2 and that was a best of breed decision. And that one the day. Yeah. So, so I had interpreted symmetrical as meaning the encoding, decoding challenges were more or less equal. That's, symmetrical. That's what I meant. In fact, there's actually reuse of logic in the. Uh, so it's super symmetrical. Where the LZ2, it's one set of logic to compress and all different set of logic to decompress. And it's a much larger chip image to do LZ2. Continuing the discussion of LTO with uh, John Teal again, and now uh, Brad Johns. Okay, um, we're back, and I said we had some special guests t today. Uh, Brad Johns was a member uh, of the LTO team, perhaps multiple occasions, and I'm going to let Brad uh, introduce himself and tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, I'm Brad Johns. I'll uh, give you a little bit of my background. I graduated from the University of Arizona in 1977, but I grew up in California. The reason I ended up in Tucson, actually, was I went to uh, the State of California 220-yard dash final in 1972, and I, I did well enough that I got a track scholarship to the University of Arizona. So I grew up outside Sacramento, actually, a little community called Fair Oaks. My dad worked for Aerojet General and part of the Gemini program. They were one of the subcontractors. So I got to the University of Arizona and along the way of getting my undergraduate degree, there was, a, there was an IBM mainframe in the bottom of the math building. And I had taken as much math, I had enough math to get a minor if I could take one more math class and I didn't want to take partial derivatives. I'd gotten through calculus and the last thing I wanted to do was to jump into it. And they had this class on computer programming in the math department for three units on an old IBM mainframe. So I learned to code Fortran. 
Um, basically, a brute force technique is how I would describe my programming expertise. Um, in the bottom of the math department at the University of Arizona. And then subsequently, I graduated in 76, couldn't get a decent job because nobody in Arizona, or rather in California at the time, knew that the University of Arizona existed. It was what, is that a junior college? I mean, what do they do? Because they weren't part of the Pac-10 at the time. They had their own conference. So uh, I got admitted back to the U of A in the fall of 76 in the master's degree of business administration. And, uh, and that was fine. Uh, I graduated uh, in the winter of 77 because they gave me so many credits for all the, the undergraduate work I'd already done. And IBM had decided to hire MBAs. So uh, the uh, luck of the draw was here I was doing an IBM interview and they said, well, have you, have you ever done any programming? I said, well, as it turns out, I have programmed on an IBM mainframe in Fortran. And they said, well, check one. They're hiring for sales, but we would like them to be able to do a little programming. And have you ever done any sales? And one of my summer jobs uh, when I'd go back home to Sacramento was door-to-door -door sales, selling uh, those little street numbers that people paint on the curb. So. Uh, I had done sales, so check two, you know, so and I, and I had an MBA, so they said MBAs, we're hiring MBAs this year. Uh, guy's done sales and he knows how to program. So IBM hired me in Phoenix as a sales trainee in the data processing division in 1978, when IBM was just hiring a lot of people in sales at the time. The mainframes were going to take up the world, and the data processing division was the mainframe division, and so I was lucky enough to, uh, for me, it was hitting the mother load to get hired by IBM in, in Phoenix coming, coming from my background. So uh, we started off doing a lot of sales. I worked with a lot of large customers in, in Phoenix. Eventually, they kind of turn you loose on the unsuspecting customer population after a couple years of training. And I had some customers like Motorola, uh, which had a very large data center in Scottsdale at the time, five mainframe computers, all IBM disk, uh, all IBM tape, 3420s were huge there. Uh, they were doing computer simulations on IBM mainframe computers, 3033s and 3081s at the time. And then I moved from, uh, after being successful there, I moved to Los Angeles where I eventually ended up in sales management and I worked with some large aerospace companies, both uh, Rockwell and Lockheed. And then from there, about the time John mentioned uh, things got difficult for IBM in Tucson, things got difficult for IBM in the field in Los Angeles too, and we downsized significantly. I ended up moving into a marketing and consulting role in what they called aerospace industry marketing at the time, and we reduced our headcount by 90% over a two-year period. And I found myself doing consulting uh, where I had been smart enough or lucky enough to have hired some really good engineers who were very familiar with CAD systems and engineering workflows, engineering process, and I was able to join the IBM Consulting Group and, as a business process re-engineering, which was the thing in the middle, uh, in the middle 90s, and help uh, large customers, aerospace customers and automotive customers, improve their engineering design and change processes. So I, that was all great. It kept me gainfully employed. Uh, at that time in IBM, if you could bill your hours, you could keep your job. So I was able to do that, but I was on a plane, like most consultants, 60, 70% of the time. So that was kind of worrying on me. Then I got this uh, call from a friend of mine who was the director of sales for uh, sales and marketing for uh, tape storage. Pete Toronto was the director, and he said, hey, would you be interested? I'm going to be hiring a marketing manager in Tucson. Well, I was tired of traveling uh, every day of the week, as interesting as the problems were. I had two daughters at home, and it was very difficult to only be there, you know, 30 percent of the time. So I left at the opportunity. Uh, I had actually started looking outside IBM because of the time, you know, living on a plane wasn't really 
going to work for me. So I showed up in Tucson in February of 1997. I actually showed up a week earlier than planned because my consulting engagements had ended and I was anxious to get started at the new job. And so I called Pete and said, hey, can I come in a week early even though technically I'm still working as a consultant for another week. So I ended up in Tucson in February of 97, which was, uh, as he heard from John, was an interesting time. The con consortium hadn't quite been announced yet, but uh, all the executives had pretty much lined up behind it, uh, and it, we were very entrepreneurial, I guess would be the way I'd describe IBM Tucson at the time. And so you didn't really say, well, this isn't my job. So when they said they needed to develop a forecast for this thing called linear tape, uh, um, the forecaster just retired. And so I had the opportunity to do probably the first official business forecast that went through the IBM process simply because there was nobody else to do it. Um, and that was for my first introduction to linear tape open at the time was really working on that project trying to figure out how IBM was going to sell it but also how were we going to do this thing called OEM sales which was new from my background. I came from the IBM brand perspective and uh, but there was this whole other channel that uh, Jim Vanderslice was very familiar with. IBM was very successful selling hard disk drives at the time to multiple uh, customers for inclusion in their subsystems. And so we had this channel called OEM, uh, which we called it the OEM channel, but basically where we were reselling uh, HDDs to a lot of system providers and system houses. And the thought was, well, we need to do this thing called OEM. So all of a sudden, uh, at least our initial versions of the, the business was say, well, we got the IBM stuff. We know how to do those. But what are we going to do with this OEM channel? So we had to come up with some interesting and creative techniques to try to go after it. And as John mentioned, trying to understand, you know, how how successful were we going to be selling IBM technology to some of these major system houses like Sun or Compaq. There was a whole bevy of system houses at the time. And there was an entrenched competitor at the time called Digital Linear Tape, which was pretty much in the, you know, what we called the, the open systems world, which is basically large Unix-based systems as well as probably large Microsoft NT systems at the time, Microsoft servers. How are we going to uh, be successful in that market space? What were we going to provide? So it was, uh, it was fun. It was my first real touch of it um, in terms of developing the business case for it. And then I also had the uh, opportunity to actually announce the IBM branded flavors because we were all wearing different hats. Uh, in August of 2000 when we did the official announcement that was I had the IBM logo version there were other announcements from other uh, system providers that we had succeeded in selling our technology to uh, and that was kind of an interesting perspective because we had a new we were starting to see some transitions on the executive team at this point we had a, a new business line executive called her name was Brenda Sawatsky, who was actually our executive at the time of the launch. So we had gone through, uh, had gone to Barbara and then had been to Barry Rudolph, right? And then it was Brenda. So, so from a leadership perspective, there were uh, Bob Manises involved. There were people. Oh yeah. There were people who didn't want LTO done. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there were some internal discussions because we were being very successful with our high-end uh, mainframe attach product, the 3590 at that time, um, it, you remind me of a very interesting discussion. We said, well, it seems uh, kind of trite, um, and, but it was like, well, who's going to, who needs a 100 gig cartridge? I mean, DLT was being fabulously successful with 30 or 40. We had a 20, I think, uh, gigabyte drive on our mainframe. This 100 gig, I mean, who's going to use it? We actually had salespeople telling us we did we were developing a product that nobody really would want, uh, which was made our life interesting as we were doing the forecast. So but that was a situation I mentioned. Capacity became king, but I didn't say it was a justifiable assumption. It just became well, the, you know, uh, 
the ticket to admission. Yeah, that was fun because during that time frame, uh, so I arrived in 97, it was important enough we got incremental uh, marketing budget to do market research. And we actually did a, it, it took a couple years because you, you can't do everything you want to do at the, immediately, but the net result was we did in fact validate that capacity was king because there was another format uh, that was similar to IBM's dual reel 3570 called Excellus. And, it, and we had to make a business decision. We couldn't do them simultaneously. Um, we had to pick one or the other. So it, it probably validated what I think everybody knew, but sometimes that's what market, good market research does, is that you actually had some numbers on a piece of paper that said, yes, customers really do prefer the capacity offering versus a, uh, a lower capacity offering, which did have some other positive attributes such as uh, very rapid access to the data. So that was a conscious decision. In fact, uh, there was, I think, an expectation on the part of our partners within the LTO consortium that we were going to do that format because we did all of the, the contractual work to actually provide that format in a license to someone if somebody wanted it to build that. There was a uh, Excellus format license available. Yeah, yeah, that's just a piece of clarity. I had mentioned the 3570, the dual wheel, our open product that was going to go where Exabyte went. We, we wanted to leverage this LTO consortia to help us, if, 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 if it was viable, keep 3570 alive. It wasn't a little bit like it. <laughs> <laughs> it was wait. exactly like it. <laughs> HP and Seagate were resistant. They didn't care about, you know, IBM's little problem selling a product that's kind of a non-starter from their point of view, but we kind of, as part of our condition of coming to the party, uh, we accepted Seagate, so now you have to accept a second flavor of this standard. So we had two flavors, one Ultrium, one Excellus. These are foreign words to the audience, so Ultrium's the one that kind of survived and became what people think of as LTO. Excellus, the first spec got done but then it went away. It sounds like you're transitioning into LTO, or did you want to finish? I went, there's, a, there's some more things around the, <laughs> okay. the well, biography's done, but uh, I think it was kind of fun. So well, we, you retired? Well, that's, that's a few years later. Okay. Uh, but the, the point that was, I think, uh, kind of interesting at that time is, uh, we, by the time we did the announcement, like most projects, it cost you more and took longer than you thought, right? So there was a great deal of focus within IBM on the product announcement itself in, in 2000. And, uh, and so we, like I mentioned, had done a, a tremendous amount of market research. Um, and we were fairly confident that we had a, a, a very competitive offering in the marketplace. We had, we had uh, if I recall correctly, surveyed over 500 customers. We had done focus groups, we had product concepts, we had talked to uh, salespeople who were familiar with the open system space who were very excited about, about the offer. So we felt pretty good about it. But we still had this entrenched competitor called uh, DLT that, that was looking at uh, you know having to seed some ground in the marketplace for us to be successful. And they were very well aware of what we were doing because we were in the public eye. So the the uh, uh, anticipation on DLT standpoint is they, they started talking about something called Super DLT. They were going to have a boot, new and improved product offering in the marketplace, and it was going to be backwards compatible with their existing DLT products. And of course, they, they saw our specs, which we had publicly made available, that we were going to have a 100 gigabyte cartridge, and, uh, and their spec was 110. So they had a little more capacity, they had backward compatibility, they had a huge install base of customers. So I recall this one dinner with, I won't name the analyst, uh, but we had a very nice dinner because you want to meet with these various industry consultants and brief them on what you're doing. So uh, hopefully they'll say something nice about you when you actually do the product announcements. And we're there with Brenda Zawoski, who was the current executive, and Bob Manis, who was the business guy at the time. And, and this consultant, and I don't know if 
John, you were at this meal. I'm not sure who the tech, but it was a it was a big meal, a nice restaurant, lots of wine, and the consultant said, you know, you guys, you're 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 not going to you're not going to be really widely accepted. I, I hate to break the news to you, but you know, given all the advantages of the the DLT format and now Super DLT, and they've got compatibility and their specs look better than yours, uh, you guys are just you know you'll be lucky if LTO gets 10% of the market in total. Um, so this is as about a month before we launch the product. This is our this is our good luck and uh, you know too bad to tell you candidly that I think you guys are are not going to be very successful in the marketplace. Of course I I didn't share with him that we we had answered that question to our own satisfaction because we'd done all this market research and I had spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to come up with a completely different answer, but I wasn't going to give him my answer in that conversation at all. Now, was this an LTO meeting or an IBM meeting? This was an IBM meeting. Okay. So but he was talking about the LTO format right. in general, total of I just wanted to clarify, yeah. because you're going kind of down an IBM-centric route here, which is fine. Which was true in 2000. That's kind yeah. of another story of yeah. the day. Yeah. I'm curious as to how you felt the first time you walked in a room and sat down with HP and Seagate. What was that like? Because that certainly wasn't our normal way of doing things uh, until that happened. Well, that that happened a couple times uh, in a different. First time happened two times. First time. <laughs> well, it, it really did yeah. because I I came in as a marketing, uh, as John described. We set up these different virtual <clears throat> teams. So at one point. Uh, I was the marketing very shortly for like a year, but I was being pulled different ways within IBM, which I'll talk about that. But then uh, a couple years later, I was the business lead. Okay. So there really were two different introductions. Sure. One was to the marketing guys when uh, I can't remember all the players I met, but a couple meetings there. But it was kind of in the middle between 2000, it was probably between Gen 1 and Gen 2. Well, we're going to have Bruce talk about the marketing team, so maybe you could just uh, share some of the, the business yeah. difficulties, of, uh, particularly in the context of all three companies, not just in the internal IBM business case. Right, All right. So, uh, so then a couple years later, about 2000, it was just before we were Gen 3, it was the year we announced Gen 3, so in 2004, I took the business lead role for IBM, uh, which I did for a little over four years at that point then. <laughs> and as John was he asked a good question, it's at this point the virtual company concept was pretty well entrenched, and uh, and the people that I was interfacing with from HP and from uh, at the time it was Certans, um, because Seagate had, had spun that operation off, they had been in those roles for quite some time, and so I, and John and the, and the IBM teams had been in roles, so there was kind of this virtual team concept that was pretty well entrenched. The biggest challenge um, was understanding we were on a consensus model. So there really, you had to reach 100% agreement, which on a business side, I'm sh I know there were technical challenges. Sometimes on a business side, there were also one of, or the other of us would have a completely different perspective based on our own preferences in terms of how we were approaching the marketplace and what our business uh, strategies were. So we had some interesting things, but it, I think overall, uh, in hindsight, <laughs> that, that was one of the key aspects of being successful and being able to keep this collaboration consortium uh, working is the fact that you, we didn't have voting blocks, that we, we actually forced agreement, and we had a pretty well-defined escalation path at this point, um, which I found myself using pretty quickly as as a business lead, which was if there was a disagreement with any of the uh, sub-teams, the business team was the next point of escalation. So if there was an issue within finance or if an issue, a legal issue, the first place of trying to get a resolution was to come to the business team and we would try to work through the issue and reach reach agreement. Yeah, the business leader really worked across all of the other groups. Yeah, so there, yeah. you're the only one that did do that. It was a great education uh, because you don't. There is no real training for the for how these 
things work. It really is coopetition because you, you, you would very much have to work together in the, in the room and you're trying to do the best thing for the LTO format. And then when you left the room and you went back to your real job, you tried to uh, aggressively attack the other players in the, in the marketplace with your offerings versus their offerings. So it was, it was an interesting dichotomy. We all had it, but we were mature enough and we, could, we worked together well enough to do that. So we were the first point of escalation, but it, we would find ourselves at loggerheads on specific issues occasionally. Uh, usually as a result of changes on the executive teams within one of the companies or change of ownership. Um, like uh, the movement from Seagate to Sertans involved a certain amount of discussion and brought in a new cast of players who weren't familiar with this virtual company concept and found this very foreign in terms of how they were going to... Yeah, it was, fu it was funny that the, the new people that would enter after we had just kind of established the concept always came in with a very parochial point of view, a new boss is in town, it's going to be my way or trailways, and we would beat the stuffing out of them until they got with the program. But, it, but that's human nature, right? You're, it, the, you're it, the new exec, you think you're the new boss, and you find out there is no boss in LTO. Yeah, it was a, it was a fascinating <laughs> experience because, to John's point, uh, there, when you transition, there would be typically the the new executive or n new whoever it is on whatever team would have a very parochial point of view that says, well, this is, this is what's best for my company, so this is what needs to happen on the LTO consortium. And they were very upset when what they thought was important to have happen was failing to happen. And that would result in us going to the executive committee, which was kind of the next point of escalation. If we couldn't resolve it at the business, we'd go to the executive committee and we'd um, go to them to find, reach a resolution. And sometimes that didn't happen on the first meeting or the second meeting. And uh, I won't name the specific names, but there were occasions I, I was in some escalation meetings where we all flew into a hotel in Chicago at the Hilton right there at the airport so we didn't have to waste any time. And we we'd had meetings and at some at finally the dissenting executive would just give up in exasperation the new one to the two ones that had been there before. Seniority began became important. It 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 did in the sense that they knew they kinda heard about us needing to collaborate and work together and reach a consensus, but until they actually had to compromise something <coughs> that they thought was really important, they didn't really understand um, what might be enlightening to share maybe some specifics of a, a couple of escalation examples if you can think of any that you're comfortable with. One that I could throw out is the perpetual inability to agree on the marketing budget. HP constantly wanted to reduce it. IBM constantly wanted to spend it all. And uh, I don't know. I don't know if that's a good example for you or not. Well, that was that's actually a really good example because it, different companies had approached the specifics in terms of the marketing budget in different fashions. Some of them ran it through individual business units. Others kept it at a higher level, so it was kind of noise, and they didn't worry too much about it. So, and just for clarity, I'm sorry. The marketing budget we're talking about it has nothing to do with any of the companies as individuals. This is a pot of money that is. In, in the virtual company spent that, that people like Bruce would use to promote the category of LTO. It wasn't promoting a company. It was, it was uh, for that category. So you would think that that would not be a very parochial discussion. But as Brad was about to say, because the accounting was done differently at the different companies, so, for example, we tried to keep the virtual company's assets invisible to IBM. We claimed that we needed a firewall. And uh, I didn't want my executive to know that there was this big pot of money out there. And uh, so we, uh, IBM just cashed the royalty checks, and that's all they knew about the workings of LTO. HP had integrated LTO into their P&L almost, and so to them, LTO expense was real where at IBM it wasn't real. What I don't know is how you guys res ever resolved it. I think there was another funny rule of engagement that if we had a precedent set 
And if uh, we couldn't agree to change it, then, then the president stood. It was kind of a... Yeah, it was... So every year it was disagreed to, but every year it, it just sort went of forward. <laughs> well, it did, it, did, uh, it did end up in several executive escalations, and, and the logic that, that uh, we would use to try to resolve that is, well, what's the right thing for the format? We do need to do a certain amount of category marketing. We need to go to some industry shows and have a, a presence at uh, things like SNEA or uh, other industry-specific shows where you could talk about LTO as a category, and then all of the vendors would be there, <coughs> including the media vendors with licensees. The licensees would be in that booth so they could talk about their offerings and talk about um, the category overall. So it was, it, it generally, they, we would end up maybe not spending as much money as we would ask for, but the marketing teams figured that out, so they'd always ask for a little more than they really needed to do. So even though you came down from the original number, it was still enough to do at least the, the things that we were viewed, uh, viewed essential. Could, could I just ask a question about how this worked? Was, were the funds given to the virtual company and then the virtual company spent it, or was there agreement that the partners would spend so much in an annual agreement, the partners would spend so much in their budgets, uh, and it was not. And then how did that change when royalties started coming into the uh, virtual company, if it changed at all? Well, as I recall, we would agree to a, a we were going to spend a certain amount of money, uh, and that would, <laughs> a lot of that would go to uh, third party agencies that were actually contracted by the LTO consortium. So we would have people help us set up for trade shows. Uh, we would have people help with our websites. We'd have white papers that we uh, would uh, have developed in it to talk about our technology. To, to my recollection, we had our own bank account from the Caymans, but I, I don't know if that's accurate. Yeah. Uh, I was going to add, we, we with your IBM hat on, or we with we your... That was an LTO. As the LTO yeah. consortium. I, I think there was an LTO consortium bank account. Yeah, yeah. we had... And that's where everything flowed through. And the finance team... The finance team managed it. Managed it, was, that. it was pretty cloak and dagger, yeah. as well, you can imagine. Actually, it sounds pretty open in, in the sense that apparently there was an annual budget presented to the three parents who then... Perhaps oh, through no, escalation. It was really internal. I presented no LTO budget ever internal. The fact that HP's accounting was the way their accounting was oh. was their problem. But uh, I firewalled. So, uh, but so but th th these guys could make any decision they want within the LTO consortia with their own money, and they never had to ask for a dime from a parent. But but IBM must have contributed a lump sum well, on an annual basis. All three companies subsidized it to get it started. But once the royalties started flowing, there was additional resources. Now now don't forget, there was a cost of membership. So we we don't even know how much detail of the business structure we could discuss. But I will tell you that I had to buy a license to get a copy of my own specification to go do my own product. I can tell you it wasn't cheap. HP had to buy one, Seagate had to buy one. All the media licensees had to buy one. So there was pots of money. Every time we evolved the specification, there'd be a new big pot of money. It wasn't royalty driven. I mean, yes, I did get my drive license money out of my own budget back home, but once it was into LTO, I didn't manage it as an IPMer. These guys had full reign. So it sounds like before the royalty stream established the three companies contributed lump sums into the consortium. There was a little bit of taking turns picking up the check for a while, and uh, and I don't even know how people got reimbursed for that, probably just on a TEA in many cases. Uh, yeah, it, it evolved over time. It, it started off, each of us was kind of responsible for our own expenses, but as, as the program matured, uh, we actually had a, our own, our ability to write our own checks and to enter into our own con. When I say we, I'm talking the LTO consortium. So the business team or with the finance team develop a budget and review that with the executives, and that's where we would get into these discussions where, uh, you know, one company runs their budget through their division 
marketing budget and other companies chose to keep it off at a higher level and it was it was a rounding error relative <coughs> to all the other budgets. Yeah, just to calibrate you a little bit. First of all, Tom Gardner, comma, incorporated, can jump on the internet and say, I want to buy a mechanism license to practice or I want to buy a media license. And I think we even have a third tier of license called I just want to read your spec, and it was yeah, a lot basic. cheaper, right? Yeah. Was that yep. what it's called? Yep. And uh, and you're going to give me a check, and I'll tell you right now that check has quite a few zeros in it. But the the basic license, I think we made that pretty affordable because there were people who were infrastructure people, made format heads, they made components that the drive makers needed, and they wanted an early sneak preview of what the next level of specification was going to be to protect their piece of the business so they'd come in and buy just a document. I just want the document. If you're a media guy, you get a lot more stuff because there's verification that Ed will talk about, a lot more stuff. The point is, there was a ongoing source of income independent of the royalty stream from selling licenses. And we actually argued that our attendance at LTO meetings, they were customer meetings. The media people who bought licenses were my customers. They're paying me to deliver something to them. All right, that's a little bit of a stretch, but that was Ed and I's story and we stuck to it. And uh, that's how we got a lot of our travel approved when nobody else could travel because it was the big C customer travel. Uh, that money uh, provided an annual budget and just to calibrate you, it is on the order of uh, Three to six hundred thousand dollars for everything, and Bruce had a piece of it, and meetings had a piece of it, and promotions had a piece of it, and whatever. I don't know how it was all distributed. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't millions, but it no, wasn't no. thousands. No, it was it was enough that it could be problematic. It wasn't times. enough to attract attention. No. Yeah, I, I would bet these license fees are probably on the internet, and they're. Mighty no, even. no, the reason that I was uh, being a little mealy-mouthed with you is that because Tom will say, I want the license, and the first thing he'll get is a sign this NDA. Then you might get something interesting that you're not allowed to disclose. So yeah. us sitting here in this room, we don't even know. I mean, we, I know the exact amount of a mechanism license, but I don't know that that's a public number. And, and I'm not at liberty to say what it is because that's an LTO can virtual I, confidential thing. Can I give you an assignment uh, uh, while you're editing the uh, uh, text of this? Go to the LTO site and see what's public. And if I, it's, I'm just saying I don't know. No, I mean, yeah. if it's public, I'd be happy to talk about it. But I, yeah. I remember I said we're all going to use our own judgment and say what we're comfortable saying, sure. and I'm not comfortable personally saying what those things yeah. cost. But I just wanted you to know that there was that this virtual company had some real infrastructure independent of any of the parents. Understood, and thank you for the explanation. Yeah, and uh, that was what Brad was involved in managing. Uh, I don't know, I didn't have visibility to any escalations that were purely driven off of business concerns. Oh well, uh, the one that comes to mind, and I won't name all the players, uh, but when the transition from you know, number one, Seagate to Sertance. We had a new set of executives. Sertance was uh, funded by venture capital <coughs> during that time. So they had a different perspective than everybody else did on that consortium. So uh, a lot of the players from, from uh, Quantum, or rather from Seagate, came over with that. So they're actually the infrastructure that we worked with in the virtual company, the people and the that came over and knew it, but the new executives that were running Sertans, this was all new to them. All of the, it was, then they, there were a lot of cultural practices, this whole idea of having unanimous consent uh, and being doing the best for the format was all new. So we did have some escalations at that point. And then once again, when, when Sertans was acquired by Quantum, we went. Well, that one was really painful because, so now we're fast forwarding DLT has waved the white flag. Finally, they say it's dead. And I don't if you know if you remember the Quantum CEO or not. He was a former VP from Microsoft. I can't remember his name. Beluzo. Beluzo. Beluzo? Yeah. Rick. Was it Rick? I think so. Yeah. He was a little bit of a crazy guy. But having Quantum buy an LTO company 
and get the royalties associated with it was painful for everyone involved. Because I was saying royalties don't go with a transfer of ownership. Because I knew for a fact that, that the people, that, that Quantum having bought Sertans to get access to LTO, um, I also knew for a fact that Sertans was no longer really developing a product. They were writing HP's back, they were using HP's supply chain. So arguably they weren't really contributing anymore. And uh, by the way, unlike the license fees that were nominal, not too big, not too small, Again, I can't reveal the exact number, but media royalties were huge. Thinking, think dozens of millions of cartridges, think even at a couple of bucks a cartridge, which is not the number, but gives you scale. Uh, so quantum to be able to just buy a revenue stream that they don't have to do anything to generate kind of chapped my lips as a, but at any rate, uh, the, that was escalated and uh, wrestled and argued and it, ultimately... It, it ultimately was a result and it, uh, it was kind of interesting. But we had inter the same sort of challenges by that point. Uh, we, would, we were into the third, working on the fourth generation of the product, so... Specification. Uh, yeah. Specification for LTO. Um, but what's interesting is we were viewed as a success within IBM at this point, but the the IBM executive team on the business side kept changing. So what we found is we kind of had this subculture of people that actually understood the LTO consortium and how it worked, and it was viewed as successful. So there was a period of time where um, I found myself in the unique position in IBM where if you said, hey, I need to go do this, there was nobody would disagree with it. I need a check to buy. There was a time when we walked on water because right. the model worked so effectively. It, it and was, there were other times when they didn't want it done. It, it was, and the, the executive turnover was such that every year or two we were getting new people, and they just knew this thing was working, it was successful. So, so if you said, hey, I need to go to Las Vegas to meet with the licensees to have an LTO discussion, it was, what, how quickly can I sign it to get it approved because it was... Let me show you how effectively this was firewalled and how the extent to which LTO consortia activity was not visible to IBM standard process. I'm going to say the word brewers. I'm not going to explain it. I'm going to let Brett exp uh, Ed will explain brewers later. But there were IP people in IBM who were accountable, of course, for going out and getting IP revenue and reporting it back, and they had their own measurements, you got a little flavor of that from Dan yesterday. And uh, the storage IP person would, co would, would go into the big wigs and present a piece of paper and there was a line item on there. And all it said was brewers and a number. By the way, it happened to be the biggest number on the piece of paper by far. That person didn't even know what the brewers was. I kid you not. Because I remember being in some of those meetings and they're reporting it. And not only that, the number was so big, nobody even cared. And, you know, next chart. <laughs> but that's how firewalled it was in IBM. It was not as well firewalled in HP, which led to some of these, uh, these uh, disputes on budgets and things. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I think those were kind of the main highlights. Yeah, that's good. Uh, I wanted to go back and touch on a ground rule because uh, the business team were, was the point focus for when we couldn't agree, when the, when the children are fighting. We had a rule about disclosure of confidential information. Uh, we're not allowed to do it. So if I have an IBM piece of what we'll call secret sauce that uh, HP and Seagate aren't privy to, that allow me to be comfortable with proposing something in the specification that they're not comfortable with. We actually anticipated that and uh, we had a ground rule for it that said, and the lawyers uh, helped us frame it, that said it is okay to disclose confidential information if it is required to get agreement. I know on Gen 2 we had a huge dispute over a measly 1 dB of SNR in the media spec. I wanted to just reuse Gen 1 media, it was good enough. Uh, HP wanted to improve the specification because they felt like uh, 
they couldn't achieve the Gen 2 operating point without improving the media a little bit. At some point, I had to disclose to HP why IBM thought we didn't need to improve the media specification. They wanted 2DB. And I showed them some of our secret channel sauce stuff that they, we do a little bit differently from the way they were doing it. They said, aha, but we can't do that, you know. And so we ended up compromising at 1DB, and my media guy initially just sorted his tape, but later on they, they did improve their tape. But that's another example of a how, how we might handle a specific type of dispute. That would have been handled at a technical twig? Well, that was something that where we couldn't agree. So what's the process? What's the ground rule? The ground rule is that I, I can get a one-time get-out-of-jail-free and I can disclose my secret sauce. But in general, we were not allowed to share mm -hmm. any confidential information during these discussions. The point is these discussions had some very rigid ground rules sure. around what we can discuss, what we can't discuss, and so it, it's an elegant construct. We probably set it up so, so that it was probably the least efficient way to arrive at a specification, but it turned out that I think it did result in the goal of a best of breed specification that has, had, has been demonstrated to have some legs. Yeah. I was just asking this Gen 1, Gen 2, the compromise was ultimately released at the twig, uh, we, we actually at the twig changed, level. We changed the SNR requirement by a DB for the meeting, is by what invoke, I remember. By invoking this get out of free jail card of disclosing Well, no, so. the get out of jail didn't work. I uh, proudly showed HP why IBM felt that uh, we didn't need to improve the media. And they said, well, that's very cool and you're a real smart guy, but uh, we don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> and so then you compromised. So we at, compromised. At, at a lower number of dB increased. But I was, the, 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 the point of that example was not about dBs of SNR on media. The point of the example was the way confidential information was handled. And I don't know, Ed, did we have a separate confidential classification that was LTO confidential? Or how, we, how did we label our documents? It was all just FDA agreement, TPC confidential. We TPC, a, that's what. We had an FDA agreement between the three parties. That, okay, we'll get that up here in a few minutes. Well, why don't you just repeat what he said so it's in the record? Uh, Ed said that there was a, an end. Of, so because we couldn't talk about individual company confidential, yet we were generating confidential documents in the form of the spec, in the form of the business agreements, in the form of various things. And I'd forgotten we had a, a classification called TPC Confidential. I don't even remember what TPC stood for. Technology Providing Companies. Oh, is that what we were? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, Ed just reminded me of that. And but but my my bigger point was just this: the construction of the virtual company and the rules of engagement and the appeals processes was all I thought. Uh, very elegant and uh, it enabled this thing. I, I think it without breaking it. the law. And then the other, well, that was one of the key aspects I think of the creation. But the other uh, dimension of this that I think was we debated this over time was we had third party testing to make sure you were compliance uh, uh, that you complied to the spec. And we had a company, where were they? Torrance? They were in Torrance, California. Ed is going to talk about the compliance in a few minutes, but they're an example of a contract with a service provider in this case. There was a contract between the service provider and the virtual company. That contract completely invisible inside the three companies just existed out there. So, so this virtual company uh, really did operate like a virtual company. It had its own bank account. It could negotiate contracts. There was lots of things it could do. And it provided us a, a mechanism to say an independent third party validated that you know the various licensees had in fact complied with the specification. It was a, and not that any of the companies probably couldn't have done that themselves, but this kind of just cleared any uh, any perception that it was anything less than really adhering to the specification that there was no real way to <laughs> and it was a very, get around it. It was a very powerful marketing tool, which is a good segue to marketing. Okay. A yeah. couple, couple of <laughs> questions, or actually, I think we had one example or a broad example of uh, 
disputes resolved, uh, actually got escalated out of the uh, business committee. Could you give us one or two interesting examples of things that worked out in the business committee? And maybe one example of something that was escalated from one of those prior committees, but you guys worked out? If you like, you can think about that, and we'll come back. At, uh, yeah, I would have know, to. Because I think you're going to have to dredge your brain. A little yeah, bit. I have to, I'd have to think about that. And I'd like to get moving on, get moving on on this not, so that we can kind of Not a problem. We can it up. One, la uh, one last question. What mainframe did you work on? Uh, when I uh, joined IBM, the current portfolio of mainframe products were the 3000 series. So it was the okay. 3033s, 3032s, 3031s, and it's one data point I still remember on those machines in 1978, uh, one megabyte of memory, one megabyte, cost a million dollars. So there were sales reps who made their quota by going from a four megabyte 3033 to an eight megabyte 3033. Remember we talked about how much cash cost in the old days and why we hit vacuum <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I have a second follow-up for both of you guys. You, you've used the term Gen 1, Gen 2, Gen 3. I'm assuming those were the code names that led to LDO2, LDO3. Well, they weren't. Yeah, I mean, there was a correlation, yeah. But actually, you raise a good point. Is One of the things when we, uh, this goes back to the early days, when we were first kicking around, well, how are we going to go to market uh, with this thing called LTO? One of the aspects that was really differentiating in the marketplace is providing customers visibility into the planned roadmap for the technology. And, and once again, that's a marketing tool, so I'd like to kind of get us oh, yeah. over no, I, that domain. But, but that was something... Because if anything, that's something Bruce wanted, because that's something DLT didn't have. They didn't have a roadmap. 